In this video, we're gonna to put together a very simple keyboard driver with the main goal of being able to type things into our operating system. We're not gonna to worry too much about handling things like function keys and these types of advanced keyboard concepts. We're really just gonna focus on getting things typing Then we can continue to extend it as we need it later on. So let's jump right into it and see how we can set this up. So the first thing that I'll just note here is I have imported my printf function inside of this code. The reason why I did this is just so that I could show you some of the different things related to the keyboard setup as we're going through it. You don't necessarily need it, but I will have a link to this code in the description so you can pull it over if you would like. I'm gonna go ahead and create a new file in here, which is gonna be called keyboard.c, and I'll create another file called keyboard.h. Now, before we get into these two files here, we need to discuss a little bit about what the keyboard is really going to be doing. So when you hit a key on the keyboard, it's going to send an IRQ, in this case, IRQ1. What we wanna do on that IRQ is we want to read the data that was sent from the keyboard. We wanna know which key was actually pressed. Now to do this, we have to actually get data from a CPU port. So we've seen how we can get data and send it out on a port but we also have to be able to get it in from a port. So we're gonna implement this first inside of my util.c. So I'm gonna say care, I'm gonna call it import b because it takes in a byte. It's gonna take a unit 16 port and it's just going to define a character called rv. It's going to run an asm volatile using the command in b. We have percent one, percent zero. And basically the first one here will be our equals a, which will be RV. This is the character that we're writing to. And then we're going to have the port that we want to uh, read from, right? So be DN as port. And that's really all we need. From here, we just return RV and we are good to go. So this will read a value from the port that's provided, place it into RV and then return RV back as a result. So we use this to read from the keyboard to actually see the key that was pressed. Now, of course, we're gonna update our util.h as well to add this into the header. I'm just gonna go ahead and copy this here and place it into my header right here. And that will be good to go. So as I mentioned, the keyboard is really going to work based on an IRQ. So it's gonna follow a pretty similar structure to like our timer. We're gonna have an initialization function, which I'll we'll call init keyboard. And then we'll have a handler function, which I'll call the, uh, the keyboard handler. And like our other handler, it has to take in these interrupt registers like this. Okay, so those are the two functions that we need and we're going to implement those over here in keyboard.c. Now I'm gonna set this up so that we go up, like, kind of piece by piece so you can see everything related to our keyboard setup. So first thing that I wanna show you is what happens when we press a key. To get this, all we really need to do is we need to set up the IRQ install handler. This is IRQ1, so we provide a value of one, and we provide a pointer to our IRQ handler, which is the keyboard handler function, okay? So that's all we really need for this. In order for me to get this working, I need to import a few different things, right? I, of course, need standard int.h to be able to get, you know, all my different integer types. I'm gonna to need to include my interrupts. So we're going to, imp or sorry, we're going to include interrupts slash idt.h. Sorry, this should also be include, not import this. So because it's our interrupt handler, we're going to need our util.h to be able to read data from the port. I'm going to include my standard lib slash standard IO. That gives me my printf function so that I can print out the data I get from the keyboard. And then of course I need my keyboard.h. With those imports together, let's go ahead and retrieve data from our keyboard. So the data that is retrieved from the keyboard, we get it using in port B0x60. This is where the data comes from. And it comes in two different pieces. The first piece is the code that corresponds with the key that was pressed. So every key that's pressed on your keyboard has a corresponding code for it. We typically refer to this as a scan code. And then we also have a part of the data that comes in that tells us if the key was pressed down or released, as in pressed up. So there's basically two times that it triggers when you press the key down and when you lift the key back up. So we wanna be able to capture both of these ideas, okay? So the very first thing that we're going to do is we are going to get our scan code. To get our scan code, we're gonna retrieve the data from the import at 0x60, and we're gonna end that with 0x7f. 
So that's how we get the actual scan code for this data that we're getting for the keyboard. So this tells us what key was actually pressed. So this is what key is pressed. It's the code for it. And then we have this press, which I'm going to get again from import B60 and we end it with 0x80. And this basically tells us if the button is pressed down or released. Basically one value will be pressed down and one value will be released. And just to show you what that looks like, we're just going to print out those values. So I'm gonna say scan code. We'll print them as integer values. And then we have press as percent D as well, okay? So those are the two values that we're going to work with here. And I'll just place them in here as well with scan code and press, okay? So this is what we're gonna print out and we're just gonna go ahead and run this and see what ends up happening. So first we'll go into our kernel and we'll initialize our keyboard, okay? I'm gonna to have to of course include my keyboard here. And then right over in my make file, I'm going to make my keyboard files and get them into my binary. So we'll GCC with the C flags for our keyboard. Just like this. And then over here, we're just going to put it into the linker and we should be good to go. Let's go ahead and make this. Looks like everything went successfully and then we will run this. Now let's take a look at what happens. If I press the A key, for instance, do you see that I get a scan code 30? So the key A is equal to 30. And you can see that when I press it down, it gives me a zero. And when I release it, it gives me a negative 128. So that's how we could tell if it was pressed down or if it was released, okay? Now we can go through our keys one by one. So like escape is one and then one is two and then three, four, five, six, so on and so forth like that. It goes sequentially along the row of your keys. So this gives you an idea of how we could see each of the different keys that we have. Now we could press different keys to see, you know, what codes they correspond with. I've gone through all of the work of sort of mapping these together. So you don't necessarily have to worry about this, but if you want to see, you know, how we would figure out which code corresponds to which key, if you want to add in different key uh, functions later on, you can just press on that key and it will tell you the code associated with it, doing things this way. So that's how we actually get data from the keyboard. Now let's interpret this data in a useful way. That is to take a look at the scan code and the press and determine what to do with it. The easiest way to do this is to use a switch. So we're gonna do a switch based on the scan code. And we're gonna have a variety of different cases that we're going to wanna to handle. Now there's a bunch of cases for scan codes, which are things that I'm not gonna do anything with. I'm just going to throw them away for now and maybe sometime later on, I might do something special with these particular characters. But for now, I just don't wanna print them. So that is for 129, there, there's a whole bunch of them. So it's 56, uh, 59, and these ones kind of go a bit more sequentially. So it's 60, 61, 62, 63. Let me just type out the rest of these. So it's uh, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, and then it's 87 and 88. There's probably more than just these ones, but these are the, the main ones that I've noted as ones to just sort of ignore for now. So it's things like uh, these, the function keys, for instance, we're not gonna print these onto the screen. We could do something with them later, but we don't necessarily need to. This one is escape. And then the rest of these are probably like control and alt and these types of things, okay? So those are ones that we just want to ignore for now, and we can, we can do something with them later on if we would like. Now, the next one that we need to handle that's special is 42. And 42 is the shift key. When the shift key is pressed, we want to trigger something to say that we are currently in the capital letter set of uh, keys, right? Because of course, a lowercase a and uppercase a are different and things like one change based on the shift key, right? They become like exclamation point, right? So we wanna keep track of if the shift key is pressed down or not. So I'm gonna have a bool, which I'm gonna call caps on. And we're just going to initialize it to false. And what we're gonna do is if this is pressed down, so if press is equal to zero, it means that the key is pressed down, we're gonna set caps on equal to true. Otherwise, we're gonna set caps on equal to false, meaning that it was released, right? So it's no longer being pressed. So 
we're going to set that to false. And that's all we really need to do for the shift key. We don't need to print anything. We just simply are going to you know, keep track of if the shift key has been pressed down or not. It's just kind of like a state, right? It's keeping track of the state to see if we have caps pressed down or not. Now, similarly, we also have the caps locks. Caps locks does something very similar, right? If it's pressed down, then we want to be writing in capital letters. Otherwise, we want to be writing in lowercase letters. But it's slightly different in the sense that we don't hold down the caps locks key, we just press it. So generally, we could say, you know, we'll keep track of if cap locks is currently on. It's another state that we can track here. So I'll call it bool caps lock. And again, I'll initialize it here to be false. And generally, we're going to say is if caps lock is not on and press is equal to zero, so it was pressed down, then caps lock is equal to true. Otherwise, if caps lock is on and the press is equal to zero, then we're going to turn caps locks off. So basically, we're just toggling it on or off depending on the state that it was currently in. Right, so that's all we're really doing here. Now the final case here is our default case. This is for everything else. And all we're gonna do is we're gonna print them onto the screen. And we're gonna print them when the key is pressed down. So it presses equal to zero. And generally what we're gonna do is we're gonna have two different cases. We're gonna say, if we're in capital letters, we're gonna pick the capital version of the character. Otherwise we're in lowercase letters. So we pick the lowercase version of that. So if we have caps on or caps lock, right, then we're going to print out the character from an array of uppercase based on the scan code. And we'll define this in a moment here. Otherwise, we're going to be printing from the lowercase of the scan code, okay? Now, how do we actually implement the uppercase and lowercase? So we're going to do that using arrays. And it's two arrays that are really quite large because they encompass a lot of different characters. I'm going to copy them over. And like I said before, I will have this code available so you could just copy these over. You don't really need to type these out one by one, right? It's not really too valuable for you. So uh, to save you some time, just go ahead and go into the code and just copy these two over. Now you can see here that the lower cases are mapped in a pretty consistent way, right? So remember like escape scan code, for instance, is one. So it's the first element or element one rather in this list. And we go one, two, three, four, and so on and so forth like this and be increased sequentially. There's a bunch of codes that are unknown because they're not really mapped to anything. So we just set those to an unknown value. Now, similarly, the uppercase letters here are just the uppercase version. So you can see that they correspond one to one. The one is simply an uppercase one or an exclamation point. You can see similar types of patterns with like, for instance, QWERTY, the Q here corresponds to this lowercase Q here. They're in the exact same indexes, just uppercase instead of lowercase. Now you might be asking, what about all these like special ones like left shift, right shift, where are we defining those? Well, we'll define them just above. We define them in a particular kind of way. And there are probably a lot of different ways to define these, but the way that I've seen commonly used is we set up just like a constant and we set it equal to a value that is not currently being used. And typically that's just kind of like all Fs as a result like this. And then we just subtract one each time as we go down, just to make sure that each of these gets a unique sort of value. This is basically very similar to like an enumeration, right? And you could, you know, do something like an enumeration like this, or you could do something like this here. And I do understand here that we could have just written this as like FFE like this. Uh, this also works. The compiler is probably just going to optimize it down into the constants anyway, so we don't really need to worry too much about that. Uh, you can do it like this, or you can write up the constant values. doesn't really matter. One way or the other, it will still work, right? So this gives us values for each of these different uh, setups here. So if we want to be like looking for a particular character, we could use these values to actually, you know, retrieve those to make our code a little bit cleaner in terms of like, you know, using like an enumeration type of idea rather than using like, uh, you know, scan codes or something like that. But like, you know, both of those circumstances will work fine. So with this, we now have all of these up and rolling, it looks like. Um, I noticed that I have like an extra comma here. I'll just remove those extra commas. Probably aren't really needed. And I think we cover all of our cases. So all of this is taken care of. There is one other thing that we're going to need to do, but what I'm gonna do first is I'm just gonna compile this and show you exactly what we've got. So, oh, I have a few small typos here that we'll just come through and fix. 
Well, press equals equals zero, and I realize that scan code should be uppercase C here, so that it matches the variable name. Let's get that one more try. There we go. So we put this together now. Notice that we can actually type, right? But you'll see, as I did there, the backspace key doesn't really work for us, right? Do you see the backspace key tries to print out an actual character? This is a problem because we don't actually have a way of handling a backspace currently, but we can implement one very easily. Inside of our VGA code, if we come over here, what we're gonna do is we're gonna find our case statement that has all of our different special characters like the carriage returns, and we're gonna add in a new case for backspace slash B like this. And what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, first off, if the column is equal to zero, so we're at the you know very beginning of the line and we hit backspace, we wanna go up one, right? So we basically check you know if it's equal to zero and the line does not equal zero so that we're not like going past the bounds of our uh, actual screen. Then we're gonna take the line and subtract from it and we're gonna set the column equal to the width. So that brings us up to the next line right at the very end, right? Now to actually erase, what we do is we say VGA at line times width plus minus minus column is equal to a blank character or current color. This is very similar to this logic here. We're just subtracting here instead of adding, right? So we're just moving back one in terms of a backspace, right? Then of course, don't forget your break here, otherwise you're gonna end up with weird things happen. And that will take care of our backspace characters. So let's give that one more try here. When we get into here, now I can type like hello world. And do you see that backspace generally works? And we can further test to say like, you know, if I get all the way to the end of the line, if I backspace, do you see that brings me up to the next line at the very end? So you can see that that functionality is working for us as well, the actual wrapping on the screen. And with that, you now have a very basic keyboard implemented. So we can now type things into our operating system. Our operating system recognizes what we're typing and it's able to print that out onto the screen for us. So like I said, this is a very simple keyboard driver. Just wanted to get things wired in and get us able to type. Uh, there's probably more functionality that we'll add into this as we continue on developing. But for now, this is really all we need to get ourselves up and running. So thanks so much for watching this video and I'll see you in the next one.